It's the waters of Green Bay with really re rehabilitation of whitefish in tributaries. So fish community objectives, are, whitefish are in, under the Bentham Four objective. Fish community objectives to maintain an expected yield somewhere between four and six million pounds on an annual basis. And specifically in the fish community objectives, if you read it, it says that demand will continue to foster a desire to sustain the current objective. You want river spawning populations to rehabilitate it. And we also want to try and understand the variability in the yields and whether these levels of yield are sustainable or not through time. This graphic illustrates the total height of the bars represent the yield of Lake Whitefish from Lake Michigan from 1976 through 2014. In 2015, the red shaded area is the fish community objective, and the vertical red bar is really where we have data from all jurisdictions through this time series. The thing to notice is how far below the fish community objective the yield has been for the last three years, 2015, just like we saw for Lake Huron, it was one of the more worst years we've ever seen for commercial yields. But there wasn't anything that really did well in 2015, whether you're talking a recreational fishery or a commercial fishery in the Great Lakes Basin. Nobody did exceedingly well in 2015. So right now we're below the fish community objective for three years in a row. And whether that continues for four years in a row, we'll see, but I'm not optimistic. For those of you who sat through my Lake Huron presentation, I'm going to embark on the same sort of analysis. That is, I'm going to develop this stock status evaluation where we essentially assign one number to a particular population of fish and to use that to describe what the status of that population is. Again, it's, it's assigning a, a minus one, a zero, or a one to a particular parameter. And the parameters we use are commercial fishery catch rates, spawning stock biomass, recruitment, mortality, and then BPJ, not PBJ, but BPJ, best professional judgment to judge where these populations are. Essentially, if the parameter changes over the last three years is greater than 15%, it gets a plus one. If it's between 15, negative 15 and positive 15, it gets a zero. And greater than a 15% decline, it gets a minus one. These are commercial fishery CUEs across the primary management units where we measure them. WFM01 and all the graphs should be the same. WFM01 is Northern Green Bay, then Wisconsin waters. WFM02 is Northern Lake Michigan, east of Big Bay to Knock. WFM03 is a very Northern management unit. WFM04 is essentially Beaver Islands. WFM05 is Grand Traverse Bay. WFM06 is the Leland area. WFM08 is the Muskegon area. There's really only one management unit where relative abundance in commercial fisheries showed any positive signs at all, or at least zeros. That was in WFM05, Grand Traverse Bay, where I think it increased in gillnets the last couple of years. Otherwise, we've seen a pretty significant decline across the lake. So as a whole, for all our management units, the value would be minus 3.5 for Lake Michigan as a whole in terms of commercial fishery catch rates. Whitefish spawning stock biomass doesn't look a whole lot different than the values that I've shown you for Lake Huron. These values, what I'm going to show you for recruitment, spawning stock, biomass, and mortality, these are outputs from statistical catch at age analysis conducted by the modeling subcommittee. The black line through the bar is Wisconsin doesn't have a complete model, so what I've used here, this is relative abundance of whitefish caught by the Wisconsin DNR in gillnet, fall gillnet surveys at Cardi's Reef. Essentially, this is their estimates of spawning biomass in Wisconsin waters for their primary spawning population. Biomass peaked, again, somewhere in the mid-2000s. It's declined, well, from roughly 50 million pounds to 20 million pounds, defined by, declined by over 50%. So if you rank them as a whole, this still what didn't occur across all management units. Some management units, we saw some leveling off. So as a whole, we give spawning biomass whitefish in Lake Michigan a minus one. Recruitment, this is basically recruitment at three. Almost every one of our catch and age models looks at, catch, looks at estimating abundance of age three fish as the first age in the catch and age models. As a whole, we have seen some estimated increases in recruitment the last couple of years. Whether these are real or not, particularly for the 2014 year and 2011 year class, we'll see. The last year class in catch and age models is also the one we have the least amount of confidence in because we have the least amount of years worth of data for those year classes. 
but as a whole, it looks like recruitment is, is about even. Over the last three years, recruitment's been about stable. Over the long time period, recruitment has declined from, say, 20 million fish to 5 million. So we've seen a huge decline, 75% reduction in recruitment of these populations across Lake Michigan. But the last three years look stable. That's why it gets, to, that's why it gets a zero classification. This is just an, another example. Again, we don't have catch age models for Wisconsin, but what Scott provided me was information on size distribution of whitefish caught at the Cardi's Reef Assessment in the fall. The red arrows indicate the trends for each one of the size groups. So as you can see, for, from 420 up through 540 millimeters, basically we've been seeing declines in representatives of smaller year classes, which indicate declines in recruitment. And we've been seeing increases in catch rates of larger size age classes, which is indicative of reduced levels of recruitment. Basically what we have are just a bunch of big old year classes supporting the populations. This graphic is estimates of total annual mortality. The bars in each graph represent the average annual estimate basically for ages four and older fish. The horizontal red bars represents the target. So in the 1836 seeded waters, the target is 65% total annual mortality and almost well, in all our populations in 1836 waters, total mortality estimates are less than the target and substantially so in some manager units. It's not true in Wisconsin, which is the lower right. That's mainly because their management objective is different. Their management objective is only 35 to 40 percent total annual mortality in these stocks. Their average over the last few years based on age composition at Cardi's Reef for spawners is about 50 percent on average. So as a whole, Actually, uh, mortality rates were doing pretty good. The whole lake as a whole gets a plus six. And if you take all these and you put them into some sort of trend analysis, and all I'm trying to do here is, uh, you know, bars above the zero line indicate that there's positive trends over the last three years in these management units. So WFM01, which is Big Bay and Anak, WFM05, which is Grand Traverse Bay, and WFM06, which is Leland, all get a positive score. It's the largest one being in Grand Traverse. The real negative are in uh, WFM02, which is the northern part, western side of the northern main basin, WFM08, which is Muskegon. Wisconsin gets a little bit of a decline, and so does WFM03. WFM04 gets a zero score. So that's the picture in terms of stock status in Wisconsin. It's about equally split. Maybe in our bigger stocks, maybe not quite where we want them. If I superimpose other lakes, these are two of our Lake Huron management units, Northern Lake Huron, which is NLH, WFM H05, which is the Alpine area. These get big negative scores. We've seen huge declines in recruitment, which I showed, declines in relative CPUE. Then if you look at the Lake Superior populations, three of the four in the 1836 seeded waters, those populations are doing pretty well. So across the upper Great Lakes, really the, the recruitment issues that we're seeing are really specific to Lake Michigan and Huron in the main basin. It's not lake-wide in Lake Michigan, and really the best populations are really in Lake Superior right now. So that's what I have. So in terms of stock status over the last three years, yield is less than FCO, declining by more than 15 percent. Commercial CUEs are declining by more than 15 percent. Spawning stocks are declining by more than 15 percent. Recruitment over the last three years appears stable, although it's substantially reduced from where it was a decade ago. Mortality is, for the large part, stable and below targets. And my best professional judgment, I would have rated the populations as a whole as stable. And the present status of whitefish populations in Lake Michigan, you know, this is my judgment based on this, they're stable to declining. They're certainly better than they are in Lake Huron, which isn't saying a whole lot. Scott? Okay, thanks, Mark. I appreciate it. I've um, always seen myself as an, kind of an opening act for Mark Ebner, so it's kind of odd for actually to be following him up here. But, uh, at any rate, um, so I'm going to talk about uh, something a little different, a little different trends than what Mark has been talking about. It hasn't been all gloom and doom uh, whatsoever for the Green Bay uh, population of whitefish. And um, I'm going to try to not repeat a lot of what's been talked about before. Uh, Brad Eggle gave a presentation um, that I put together a couple of years ago about the river spawning 
whitefish uh, phenomenon that's going on in Green Bay, so I'm trying not to replicate a lot of that, but uh, f forgive me if I do. Um, <clears throat> looking at this map here, really essentially I'll be talking more about what is WM1, which is kind of our zone one, um, whitefish management one. Um, the lower half of Green Bay is where a lot of the, the activity has been going on, more so than WM2 to the northern end, and this kind of follows the trend of what Mark was talking about earlier with productivity and the trends that we're seeing in productivity, and a lot of it matches up very much with what he's talking about with respect to where we're seeing these fish. Um, we've seen considerable changes in the population over the last 15 to 20 years. Um, of course, the recolonization of these tributaries and looking at this map, um, it's been four principal tributaries as far as we're aware of right now that we've looked at. And that, of course, the first one there is the Menominee River. That's the longest one where, where Brian Belanger first recorded them coming back in the mid-90s. Uh, the Peshtigo River as well to a certain extent. Um, within the last few years, we've been tracking that population. The O'Connell River as well, and then the Fox River. And really, um, the fox and the Menominee are, are pretty limited in the amount of spawning habitat that's available, just because there's just a handful of river miles really available before they, they hit the first dam, whereas the Peshtigo and the Okano have a considerable more uh, leeway and, and more distance before they hit the, uh, the lowest dam on those tributaries. Um, the Muskegon River, I have to mention, I don't know much about. Um, I'm just aware that there is some activity going on with river spawning fish in the Muskegon River as well. Um, we've had some very strong recruitment effects, our events. I'll talk about that and, and try to describe some of that shortly. Mine will be a much more descriptive talk than, than Mark's was, and, um, uh, not as a uh, summary form. Um, and we'll, we've seen some real dramatic increased catches in both the commercial and the sport fishery. And the sport fishery, of course, is the real, the real odd phenomenon um, of what's going on in Green Bay because it's, it's, it's unprecedented. And then with this comes an increased stock complexity. And this is what's made it kind of a challenge for us is to try to figure out what the heck is going on in Green Bay because there's a lot of mixing going on right now. The genetic work that's been done at Stevens Point over the last decade or so has shown that, that, that these fish are mixing in there. There's different populations that they're so new we really don't have a really great hold on what's going on there. Uh, the commercial fishery, if you look at this, if you recall, WM1 was the lower zone, was the lower management unit in the black there. And you can see the catches have got started out in the, mid, uh, the early 90s, the beginning of our commercial sea, uh, quota of fishery. Uh, very low, um, around 100 pounds per lift, and now the last few years have topping out around four to 500 pounds. Um, on average, um, these are considered a one-night set, which they're, they're typically not. Um, whereas if you contrast with, with WM2, the next zone to the north there, they've come down a bit, or they're, they're trending downward, and, and have been holding relatively stable, but um, definitely a downward trend. Looking at the amount of uh, harvest, in WM1, in that lower part of Green Bay, uh, the black lines show the actual harvest in thousands of pounds of dressed weight of whitefish in the commercial fishery. Um, <clears throat> and the red line shows the, shows the quota. So the last quota increase, the last time we ran our model, it's, it's, it's overdue, but it was in effect in 2010. And their, their quota was raised to about 350, 350,000 pounds. And since then, they're really the only one that's been topping out or reaching that, that quota. We don't have an overall quota. We have an overall quota for Wisconsin, but it's, it's split up between management units with Green Bay, the lower half of Green Bay getting 10%, the lower half of Lake Michigan, basically Algoma and South getting 10%, and the rest of it around the Horn of Door County on either side gets 80%. So it's, um, that's, that's a whole other issue for another day. The sport fishery. Um, I'm sure by now, I hope most of you are aware of what's going on. These are unprecedented numbers. These are um, unbelievable numbers to a lot of people. This is the amount of harvest in Green Bay, and this is just the ice fishery for the most part. These are numbers, so we're, the last few years we've been topping out you know, well over 150,000 uh, fish per year, and that's basically January through March, depending on the conditions. As you know, 2012 was a real warm year, poor ice. We had uh, a lower harvest that year. However, if you look down in the lower right-hand um, graph uh, chart there, 2012 catch rates weren't really all that low, so it was really reflective of the, the conditions that we had. 
And one thing we're having a, a hard time with out there right now is the guide fishing in the upper right hand corner. That, that's a guided vice fishing trip. Um, they've responded big time to this fishery. It's, it's really carrying the fishery, the Wisconsin ice fishery in Wisconsin as it stands right now in Green Bay. And so we are in the process right now of developing a unique guide reporting system, really just in response to what's going on with the whitefish guiding community out there right now. <clears throat> the tributary populations I'm going to talk about here, um, um, unfortunately don't have a really good hand, an idea, anything to report of relative abundance, definitely not absolute abundance. Um, we have a really hard time tracking these um, uh, populations just because mostly because of gear saturation issues because these fish all run up to the dams they all pile up there and we've been using electro fishing as our main means of capturing these fish you turn on the the juice which we have to dial down considerably and it's it's literally a fish boil it, it's it's unbelievable so you, you really can't dip all the fish that you see so I'm going to present this which has been shown before to give you a kind of a hint of what's going on out there. In 2010, we tagged over 2,500 whitefish in the Menominee River over six days. Uh, very re few recaptures during that point as, as an, an example, example. By the last day, the sixth day, we had tagged t about 2,000 fish. We'd only recaptured 11 fish to that point. So doing a, a mark recapture estimate of any sort would give you, I haven't even tried it because the confidence intervals would be, would be wild. So, it really gives you an idea of how many fish are on there. There's a lot, there's you know, somewhere between a, a ton and a lot. Um, with this study, and if you look at this, this um, map here, the darkest reds are where the heaviest uh, reported uh, tags came from. So Larson's Reef area is that real dark red area kind of off of Sturgeon Bay, and that's where the, the, between the commercial and the sport fishery, the, the most of them have come from. But we got about 3% of the tags back through 2013. A few trickled in thereafter. And the only one that came from outside of Green Bay was in 2014 from, from actually from Bailey's Harbor area. Um, it's been about a 50 to 50 to support to commercial uh, re reporting rate. So right now we sample, and I quote, sample these four rivers. However, we're really not able to give any one of them any really direct attention just because of the, res the limited resources we have right now, given that we're also looking at other spawning stock during that time of the year. Um, the Menominee River, um, we have been looking at that um, since 2009 fairly intensively. We go in there and sample annually, sometimes more than once. Um, just to give you an idea that, that the size distribution hasn't changed remarkably. Since 2009, it's really average size has only increased by about uh, 18 to 20 millimeters, somewhere around that, that, that uh, that range um, in this box whisker plot, the the uh, the whiskers are actually the upper uh, end is the 90th percentile, and the lowest is the uh, 10th percentile. So, not a remarkable change. Um, some of the factors could be a lot of strong recruitment events, exploitation could be cropping off the bigger fish in the population, and you can't rule out slow growth. We've talked a lot about how how slow whitefish are growing right now. So. Um, Looking at the, uh, a couple of tributaries, or several tributaries here, um, the fox tend to be a little bit bigger, but you know, really statistically, you're not gonna have obviously see any difference between the two. Um, um, I, the, um, sorry, I kinda lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, essentially just looking at that shows that how similar they are between the various tributaries. However, the Cardi's Reef population, which is, um, our Lake Michigan spawning population, the one that Mark talked about off the east side of Door County and the Lake Michigan side, totally different picture going on there. Old fish, big fish, limited recruitment going on there. It's a different gear, it's a, it's a gill net survey. However, the picture is quite clear that it's a very different, different thing that's going on over there. <coughs> uh, the trawl index, I'm gonna speed through these a little bit more. We've got some real strong recruitment events in the yellow is when we were actually able to record the young of the year whitefish independently. Um, uh, the blue ones are all whitefish combined. 2011 looked to be a real bad recruitment year in Green Bay. These are uh, a trawl index that Tammy Paoli conducts, um, but we had some big runoff events as you can see from these photos in 2011. These last two uh, graphs here, kind of trying to do some, just looking at some recruitment relationships with young, older year classes in our uh, gill net surveys and tying them into the young of the year uh, trawl index here. And there's a, a relatively good relationship here. We don't have a lot of data points at this 
at this point, but the, the red circles do show that, in generally speaking, at least the first one, that some of the lower young of the year catch per effort does result in, in fewer numbers of, of uh, age three, four, and five year old fish recruiting the, uh, to the gill nets, but that 400 uh, catch there is, is a bit of an anomaly. So if you take out some of these, these bigger ones, as an example here, if you take out that big catch in 2009, the, the relationship gets much better. So there could be some, some density dependent effects going on here. The, bi the big picture stuff that we've seen lately are some real strong larval production. These are, these are some uh, really neat things that happen. We've documented larval production in the Menominee River, as well as in right behind our office in Green Bay. Um, we're getting potentially larval production and, and spawning production right in Green Bay proper. Um, a lot of management concerns going on right now. We've got some proposals um, that are in circulation at this point, uh, looking at some otolith microchemistry to try to identify these uh, populations because the genetics have been so, so mixed. Uh, looking at movement patterns, hopefully employing some of the, the acoustic telemetry equipment that's out there um, to, to, to track some of these populations and their movements. And uh, predator-prey dynamics, um, EAB's done a lot of great work in, in um, Lake Michigan proper and hoping to do some of that with, uh, with whitefish as one of the species in Green Bay. Um, looking at some stock-specific modeling, Green Bay versus Lake Michigan, right now we model the whole population and in really Green Bay is obviously behaving very differently. And finally, just looking at some of the spawning site fidelity between these tributaries, uh, tagging in multiple trips, which is what we're doing right now to get a handle on that. 